Let's say that you've got a virtual assistant that is starting the conversation with something like, hi, how can I help? Well, then we might have a user that says something like, ik wil weten hoe laat jullie winkels open zijn. Now, what's happening here is that we have an assistant who's asking a question in English, and we've got a user here that's asking another question in Dutch. And there's a few things that could go wrong here. If we have a system here that's really only trained to handle the English conversation, then it is receiving text that is very much unlike anything that it's ever seen before. Now, hopefully, there'll be some sort of a fallback mechanism that gets triggered, indicating that we're not confident about our predictions with a sentence like this. However, because these models are statistical, it can be very hard to guarantee that we will get an appropriate fallback mechanism triggered. Instead, what might help is if we add an extra fallback mechanism to our pipeline and have that be one that detects the language. This allows us to have some sort of a step in our pipeline along the lines of, if we ever detect non-English, then we need to utter some sort of a language fallback message. If we want to be able to do this well, though, we will need to have a system that can do language detection. And this is something that I would like to talk about in this video. Language detection is an old problem, but for the use case of a virtual assistant, it's actually quite tricky to get right. So let's talk about language detection. Language detection, in the end, is still just a classification problem. You have some text as input, and as output, you would like to get a class, which in this case would be a language. Now, by and large, though, there seem to be two main approaches of dealing with this classification task. The first is what I would call maybe the classic approach. And the classic approach sort of works as follows. You have a token. Let's pretend it's the token for the word bonjour. And what you can do for this token is you can calculate the probability that this token is used in the English language. You can do the same thing for French. In fact, you can do this for a whole lot of languages. Assuming you've got a data set like, let's say, Wikipedia, then you can count how often in a sentence from an English document, and you can do the same thing for French. Now, note that we have a little bit of wiggle room here. Instead of just taking the token that represents an entire word, you might also be able to split this up into subwords, like, let's say, the three grams of that word. And nothing is really stopping us from calculating the same statistics, but on these subwords instead. So we have a little bit of freedom in this. But let's keep it simple and just say, well, we, we're doing this for tokens. So let's say now I wanted to have some sort of a score function that should tell me something about the likeliness of English being the language that's spoken in the sentence that's in front of me. Well, I could say, let's pick a score that's multiplying all these probabilities that I've mentioned before. For every token i that's in this sentence, we'll just multiply all of these probabilities together. And I can do the same thing for French. In fact, I can do this for lots of languages. And then as a model output, you could say something like, well, the probability of getting English, given the sentence, well, that's the score that I got for English, given the sentence, divided by for French, given the sentence, plus all the other languages. And we probably also have Dutch in here, let's say. Now, I should point out that there are lots of variants of this idea. What some people really like to do is they like to add some sort of a smoothing parameter here to prevent that a probability for a language is ever 100% zero. That's something that you could do. And as I alluded to earlier, what exactly is a token here? And can we maybe apply some extra weighting by taking subwords? Those are all variants of this idea. But in the end, you're just still counting tokens and checking how often they appear in the language. Now, there's a package in Python called LangID that is doing a variant of this old school approach. However, there's also another approach which has gotten traction more recently, and that's a more deep learning based tactic. 
And this is an approach used in the compact language detector. And there's a Python package for version three of this approach. And to some extent, it's also used in the fast text library because fast text doesn't just give word embeddings. They also come with pre-trained language detection models. I'll quickly zoom in on the approach that the compact language detector model uses, which is similar to what fast text is doing as well. What you see here is the architecture diagram that I found for the compact language detector model. There's an architecture diagram right here, and it's being fed the word banana. Now, the interesting thing about the word banana is that it has three different letters, three different bigrams, and three different trigrams. The unigrams, bigrams, and trigrams are listed here. And the idea is that we're associating a dense vector to each one of these. So you could say that these are all subtokens that each have their own embedding, so to say. Now, the extra thing that the compact language detection model does is that it reweighs all of these embeddings by counting how often the subword appears. So for example, if you have a look at the letter A in the word banana, it occurs three times in six letters. So that means that this embedding for the A token is weighted three out of six. So it gets multiplied by a half. And this is in contrast to the letter N, which only appears twice, so it gets weighted by a third. So then what happens is we get this weighted average that is being forwarded here. And then you get this concatenated embedding layer, which then goes through a hidden feed forward layer. And then you get this soft max at the end where a prediction is made and every single node here corresponds to a language that they are going to be predicting. For as far as I could tell from reading the documentation, fast text really seems to be doing something that is indeed similar, but it's not doing this weighting based on token frequency. The main thing that fast text seems to be doing that is somewhat differently is that it's also including a representation for the entire word. And I'm sure that there are some extra details as far as this architecture is concerned that's different between these two models. But by and large, this is the neural variant of language detection. So given these three libraries with these different approaches, what I figured I would do is I would maybe benchmark them and see if I could learn anything from actually applying these models on a somewhat real life data set. So what I've got over here is a Jupyter notebook and the notebook lives in a folder where I've collected lots of data files. And these data files are tab separated files where for a language, I've collected the top 1000 most common words. So for example, for Arabic, I've got some words listed over here with the English translation next to it. I have the same thing for Dutch and I have the same thing for Vietnamese and effectively for just a whole bunch of languages, I've collected this information just so I have a data set that I can use to do some benchmarking. And in the Jupyter Notebook, I've got my fast text prediction function, my lang ID prediction function, and also one for the CLD3 framework. And although all of these separate functions have extra features, for example, the language prediction model over here has this flag for is reliable. It is fair to mention that I'll be ignoring features like this and that's because the main thing that I'm interested in for now is just the language that comes out over here and whether or not I'm making a correct prediction. And the results you can see below here. So I've got a classification report. This one is for my fast text model. And let's have a, a quick look. When you look at the performance of trying to predict the most popular word in each language to what language that belongs to, then you'll notice that the results aren't necessarily great. If I just glance at this, it seems that English has a really high recall, for example, but a terrible precision. And the same thing seems to happen with the Lang ID model below here. English has a really, really high recall and a very bad precision. A language that seems to be doing quite well, though, is Arabic. Pretty decent recall. 
pretty decent precision. And the same thing holds up with Vietnamese too. And if I were to scroll down, you'll notice that there's something very similar happening to my compact language detector model. The precision for Arabic is indeed quite high, and the precision for Vietnamese is quite high as well, but still, the results here don't seem particularly promising. Now, there's a couple of reasons why we see this happen. For starters, one thing that we should recognize is that at the moment, we are checking one word at a time. And that isn't what these models were trained on. Typically, these models were trained on larger texts, sentences, paragraphs, maybe documents, and they were able to say if the entire document was English or French or what have you. In this case, we're really just looking at one word at a time, so that means that all of these algorithms do have a whole lot less information to base their prediction on. Another thing that we can measure, and I'll be having a look at the Lang ID model for that, is a form of bias. What you see here is the results of a confusion matrix, and here you see what we are predicting, and here you see what the actual language was. And looking at it from this perspective, you should notice that we do seem to be predicting English quite a bit. This is plausibly due to the fact that the data set that this algorithm was trained on had way more English examples than any other examples. And in the case of Lang ID, one of the data sets that they do use to train on is Wikipedia. And I can certainly imagine that the English Wikipedia has way more articles than any other language. You might have noticed though that Arabic seems to be performing much better and so do Vietnamese. And the reason for that is that those languages are really hard to mistake for English because their alphabet is strictly different. Considering that the alphabet is really different compared to the one that you have in English, it doesn't surprise me that the algorithm is able to distinguish that. And there's a similar thing happening with Vietnamese. There are some Unicode characters in here that simply do not appear in the English standard. Another thing to just quickly point out is that some of the words that I'm using here definitely appear in many different languages. In Dutch, a very common word is D, which usually means those, who, and, or, which. It really depends on the sentence what the actual meaning of the word is. However, it is also a really, really common word in German. It is one of the words for the. And because the word D means the in German, it is also very common. You can see that the language ID model effectively just starts predicting that the word D is most likely to be German. And given that it only has one word to base its prediction on, I also cannot fully blame it. But it is an important property to remember if I'm going to be applying these models. So considering the application, one thing I have to keep in mind is that if I'm going to be using this for a virtual assistant setting, that maybe I should not be using this on instances where I only have one word from the user. Maybe I need to only apply this language detection scheme if there are at least three or four words. Now, where this boundary exactly should be will depend on the use case, of course, but I figured it would be interesting to run one more benchmark. What I could do is I could write a simulation function. And what this function would do is it would take at random n words from the data sets that I've got above here. And I would just join them together into a sentence. This would indeed give me a very artificial data set. But considering that I have the lists of the top 1000 words of each language, I do find it plausible to assume that I could simulate the effect of having longer sentences, at least as a proxy. And here's the result. What I've got over here is a chart of the F1 scores. Now the F1 score is an average of sorts between precision and recall, but you can definitely see that when we get longer sentences with more words in it, that then the F1 score does indeed go up as well. It also seems that fast text by and large seems to be working very well here compared to the other two tools. So the results that I see here definitely seem to be more promising than what I saw before. And what I've done is I've also taken the long sentences and I've made a new 
classification report. And also here I can definitely measure that we're doing much better. So for longer sentences, it seems that for English we can assume a precision that's around 97%, which again isn't perfect. It might not be good enough even, but it's certainly better than what we saw before. Now, considering that the use case here is to maybe make a fallback mechanism, what I have done is I've looked at these results and figured this might be good enough as a component for Raza. So if you now go to the documentation page of the Raza NLU examples repository, you should now see that we've added support for some custom fallback classifiers. The feature certainly is a little bit experimental, but one thing we've added here is this fast text language fallback classifier. And if you go to the specific documentation page, you'll see more information. There's a small guide that allows you to play with the underlying language detection module in Jupyter. And there's also lots of parameters that you can configure for your own Raza pipeline. Now, again, I don't want to suggest that this model is going to be perfect, but it might be worth an experiment. You can specify the minimum number of characters and tokens that need to be spoken before this fallback mechanism kicks in. And you can also tell it what language we would like to expect and also what intent to trigger if the language isn't detected. Fast text suggests support for over 100 languages, but I would like to emphasize that it's a good idea to first experiment with this tool before immediately deploying it live. If there's any feedback on this tool though, we would love to hear more from you. So feel free to have a look at this basic usage template and let us know if it's useful.